It's almost St. Patrick's Day, so we wanted to dive into a little bit of Irish food history. In today's episode, we're gonna make a precursor to shepherd's pie, a cottage pie that dates back to the mid-1700s. Hey there, I'm Sola L. Whaley, and this is Ancient Recipes with Sola. In each episode, we take a dish you may recognize and attempt to recreate one of the oldest versions of it to ever exist. So it's a little cooking, a little history, and a whole lot of me. What's not to love? I know what you're thinking. Why not make the even more famous St. Patrick's Day staple of corned beef and cabbage? Well, corned beef and cabbage has an interesting history. It actually became a more popular dish after the massive influx of Irish immigrants to the US after the Irish potato famine in the 1800s. Plus, it actually takes five days to make, so we decided to go with shepherd's pie. It's a delicious concoction of meat, potatoes, and vegetables that's so comforting and delicious, we're just lucky to have it. Like most of the foods we make, multiple cultures have claimed to have invented the first shepherd's pie. The English, Irish, and Scottish have taken credit for its creation. But if you look at the origin of its name, then its Irish origins become pretty obvious. For a few centuries following the English taking control of Ireland in the mid-1500s, much of the Irish population became impoverished and forced into the lower class. These peasant land workers lived in modest cottages. Remember that, cottages. Fast forward to the late 1500s. The potato arrives in Ireland. This is a big deal because the potato didn't cost much. It quickly became an inexpensive staple of the Irish diet, especially for the poor and lower class. Around the mid to late 1700s, a food called cottage pie started popping up with a lot of potatoes in it. It's believed to be named after the very humble cottages of the Irish peasants. That would be the start of what would become shepherd's pie. To make this old school version of shepherd's pie, they started with a crust of mashed potatoes. Then they would add in whatever meat and vegetables they had left over, and on top of that, another layer of potatoes. To get started, I'm gonna first get my potatoes cooking. Here we've got Yukon Gold. They're gonna mash up really nice and creamy for us. I'm gonna pop them in this pot, top it off with some water, a generous amount of salt, and we're gonna get that gently simmering until tender while we cook off our lamb. Bloop. You can't do shepherd's pie without potato. I feel like the rest is interchangeable, but it's all about the potato. Oh, did you get the green one? Because it's St. Patrick's Day? So, potatoes are just covered, lots of salt. Now, potatoes do best if you start them in cold. If you plop them into hot water, they can get a little bit grainy and cook unevenly, and I'm like, putting handfuls of salt. Do you see? You need it, because a lot of that salt's just gonna get drained off. I'm gonna move these potatoes back here to gently simmer until they're nice and tender so we can mash them up. And now I'm going to heat up my oil and butter. We want it nice and warm before we add the lamb, because I want a nice sear. Brown means flavor, right? Now, this shepherd's pie is gonna be a little bit different than the modern versions. We're not using tomato paste. There's no Worcestershire sauce. It's kind of mild on the spices and herbs to like you know, tie into the humble beginnings. They would have used things that they could have easily grown on the farm. So we're just seasoning it up with like garlic, pepper, rosemary, keeping it chill. Now, you know, when you use butter and oil, it's kind of nice because the butter gives you like a built-in thermometer. Once it's foaming, you know that your pan is hot. We're almost at fromage, so close. Some chefs tell you this lie, that adding oil makes your butter burn less fast, but that's not true. It just makes the speckles of burnt more distributed throughout the oil. It's still gonna burn. A lot of old chef lies. I think we should do another History Channel show called Old Chef Lies. That sounds fun. We have foaming. It's time to add our lamb. Plop it in gently. See that sizzle? That's how you know your pan was hot. I'm gonna break this up really well so we can get even browning. After breaking it up, I kind of let it just hang out so we can get some color before messing around too much. Smush. Now, the term cottage pie was around in 1791, but shepherd's pie didn't pop up until 1854. A little smash, a little smash. Let's crank it up just a touch. Yes. I'm gonna season this right now, kosher salt. Really simple on the seasonings. You might see some recipes that have like cinnamon or paprika. We're not gonna use any of that. This is 
Going back to the humble beginnings of the cottage pie, they would have used whatever, like, scraps of meat and vegetables they had to fill up, uh, stretch out those potatoes. It's all about the potatoes. That's the start. OK. Now, while that browns, I'm going to just add the onions on top to kind of start to wilt. So everyone kind of makes shepherd's pie their own way. It varies home to home, but it was so revered in the 1700s that people took a lot of joy in trying each other's shepherd's pie. So I'm going to let this cook undisturbed until you're going to see that the meat on the top side is going to start to look opaque. That means that the bottom is going to be deeply golden. You can like take a peek every now and again, take a look, but for the most part, now is a good time to just like leave it alone and let it do its thing so you can develop a lot of color. And the onions are gonna wilt on top and like kind of seep their onion -y flavor into the meat. You can see it's getting more and more opaque. Now's a good time to take a peek. Let's see what the other side's looking like. We got a little bit of browning. Not much browning. It's not as brown as I'd like. Let's like blast it. Let's see how much this can handle. It's kind of nice. It's like we're having a moment of silence with our lamb. Now, we didn't start with a whole lot of fat in the pan, but depending on the kind of ground meat you have, sometimes it releases a lot of fat. This seems like a really fatty bit of lamb, so I'm just going to drain that off. No big deal. You can save that fat, and it's really great for sauteing veggies. OK, we got some good browning. Now I'm going to add carrots and peas and break up this meat a little bit and just cook it for a touch until the carrots and peas wilt. Oh, also some garlic going in. And rosemary. A little bit of rosemary. OK. Let me get in here, break up this meat. We got some good browning on the other side. Now, potatoes came to Europe with the Spanish conquistadors, but it is said that Sir Walter Raleigh is the one who brought it to Ireland. Ooh, yeah, we got some browning. We got some color. Once this gets all mixed up, we're going to add some flour. OK, so we're going to make the gravy by adding a little bit of flour and some water. I'm also going to season this up with some black pepper. I don't like to add the black pepper when I'm searing the meat because it can get a little bit acrid. So it's good to add it once there's some moisture in the pan. OK, so I'm going to add this flour and stir it up just so it's evenly distributed before I add the water. That way we won't get any lumps. This lamb didn't have as much fat as I thought. You need a bit of fat to help make that gravy nice and creamy. So don't skip on it completely. I'm just going to continue breaking up the meat as I go. We got some really nice brown bits that's going to be really tasty and help make us like a nice, rich, brown gravy. Once the flour is distributed and you want to make sure that it gets a little bit coated in that fat, now it's time to add the water and it will be lump free every time. So I'm going to add maybe just like a cup. This isn't going to be super saucy, but we want to make sure that it's nice and moist, you know? these little bits of browning around the edge of the pan. It's going to add a lot of flavor. So I'm going to use the water I just added to make sure I scrape that up and get that all incorporated into our gravy situation. Brown is flavor. You can go pretty, pretty dark before things start to taste burnt. So don't get scared. See this little bit? I'm not going to let it go to waste. Now that I've added the water, I'm going to let this simmer for about five minutes to get the gravy nice and thick and cook off that raw, floury taste. OK, so now I have to head off something that might be a little bit confusing if you're in the know about cottage and shepherd's pie. Nowadays, shepherd's pie and cottage pie are basically the same thing, except you add lamb to shepherd's pie and beef to cottage pie. So yes, what we're making today would be called shepherd's pie by modern definition. But remember, the first name for this kind of food was cottage pie. And at that time, the Irish still had a very special relationship with and reverence for cows dating back to their Gaelic heritage, where they rarely ate cows and used them more for their milk, butter, and dairy. So the OG version would have likely had lamb rather than beef, but be called cottage pie. See, this nomenclature for food is part of the reason why food history and culinary history can be so murky. And to make things even worse, for some time, cottage pie and shepherd's pie were used interchangeably. My potatoes are now nice and tender, and I'm going to mash them up with a little bit of milk, butter, and Irish cheese. Let's get in here and scoopity scoop. 
Now, if I'm feeling lazy, I peel my potatoes before I boil them for mash, because then you just go in and mash. But if I'm not feeling lazy, I peel them, I cook them with the skin on, slowly roasted in the oven, and then they taste really, really potatoey. But it takes a long time, and then you gotta peel them after while they're hot. You know, just go with what you're feeling that day. You know, sometimes you want to be extra. Roast your potatoes dry with the skin on, and other days you just need to eat shepherd's pie now. I think it's all good. Okay, smush. Time begins. So to here, I'm gonna add some butter. There's this one French chef whose recipe for mashed potatoes has equal parts butter and potato. They're very delicious. You know, sometimes that's what you need. Then I'm gonna add a bit of milk. This is humble, you know? We're not gonna use two pounds of butter in here. I'm gonna get it going with some salt and pepper before I add the cheese. We're also gonna add an egg yolk and that's gonna help the top get really nice and golden brown. There's already a lot of salt in that water and there's salt in the cheese, so I'm not going crazy at this point. We smush. Do you think they had potato mashers back then? Or everyone used a fork, you know? So I've gotten most of my potatoes mashed. I'm about to add the cheese and the egg. So during the time of the Irish immigration to America, the first generation of Irish Americans were in search for a taste of home, and that meant boiled bacon. But the immigrants were oftentimes too poor to afford the high price of bacon and pork products. So instead, they turned to a cheaper cut of meat, brisket, and in particular, corned beef. Corned beef was really expensive in Ireland and seen as something for the rich or special occasions. Now in America, they see the thing that was saved for the rich is actually affordable. And there you go, a taste of home for St. Patrick's Day. Okay, so now we are mostly mashy. I'm gonna take this yolk and whisk in a little bit of milk, just so I can evenly incorporate it into the mash. This is gonna make it nice and golden, give us a nice color on the top. And we're gonna add our Irish cheese, which is gonna help us get like a little gratiné vibe on top too. It's also gonna add like this nice sharpness that I think will balance out all the rich stuff we have happening. This alone, I mean, you can just eat this and be good. We're gonna layer this and turn it into a pie. Now it's cool, as soon as you add the egg, it looks really nice and rich. A lot of good color from that yolk. Folding this up. We don't have to worry about the cheese totally melting now because it's gonna melt in the oven. And now we're gonna layer potato, our meat mixture, and then more potato to make our pie. So I'm gonna kinda eyeball half this potato mixture to line the bottom of the pan. That's gonna be our base crust of potato. I mean, I think that anything wrapped in potato will be good, right? Why not? I'd love a salad that had a bottom and top layer of potato, right? Okay, now we're gonna add our filling on top. There's so much potato, it's such a good way to stretch this meat. Like this is one pound of meat, but I think we could serve like six people, like six hungry Irish people with a side of beer. That's a good meal. So I don't wanna like mess up my bottom layer. So I'm just taking a spoonful at a time. I think that the potato is also gonna keep the meat from like getting dried out or scorched. Like this pan is gonna retain a lot of heat. And I imagine if we put the meat directly at the bottom of the pan, we might have a little bit of like overcooking happening, you know? We're gonna keep it nice and saucy this way. Okay. Scrape it all in there. And we're gonna top it with a final layer of potatoes. This is gonna go in the oven to bake until it's like really golden and bubbly. And then we're gonna dig in. Potato, potato. So there's a new kind of shepherd's pie that's popping up that's getting more and more popular and it's meatless. It doesn't have an official name, but some people call it shepherdless pie or gardener's pie. And it's got different things in there like lentils, veggies, 
I bet you could also do it with like, just crumble some tofu, brown it just like you brown meat. It's really tasty. I do that a lot. No one can tell the difference. I've fooled my friends with tofu ground meat. OK, now I just did a little dollop dollop situation before smushing just so I can spread a little bit more easily without you know, getting some of that meat on the top layer. I feel like we could have almost even stretched it out with more potatoes. Keep the potato party happening. We are covered. Our pie is gonna go into the oven now and bake until it gets really bubbly. We're gonna have a nice golden brown top and then we're gonna taste. This smells really good. I'm really excited to dig in. The cheese and the potatoes gave it such a little crunchy brown crust. I'm going in. I love the little crunchy edges. I want a corner piece. I'm a corner piece kind of person. All right, let's see how you are on the inside. Ooh, steamy, saucy. All right, I'm getting, I'm going in. Time for a bite. I got a little potato, I got a little meat, I got a little veg. Mm. It's delicious, I mean, come on. Meat and potatoes, always tasty, always comforting. I really love how creamy and saucy everything is. The potatoes are really creamy and cheesy, and the meat has this really like, saucy gravy action. I think it's really, really tasty. What I like about the Irish cheese is it's really sharp. So that kind of cuts through the richness. Even though the cheese is adding richness, that sharpness really balances it out. And I think it's the perfect addition to the potato because it also gives you this excellent crunchy brown crust, which is always the best part of everything. I don't think that you could get away with calling this pie, you know? It's more of a casserole, but it's delicious either way. I don't really know how different this is from a shepherd's pie. It kind of tastes exactly the same. I mean, the only difference is the beef versus the lamb. You can't really go wrong when it's meat, potatoes, and cheese. I could eat this on like a cold day, you know, on a cold day when you've been out, you know, dig enough potatoes, come home, make a shepherd's pie. It's gonna always hit hard, you know what I mean? I love it, it's like a stick to your ribs kind of thing. I think this is super delicious. And I'm happy to have learned so much more about Irish food history. I think it would be really good with, with a cold mug of Guinness and maybe a couple of shots of Irish whiskey. You can handle it. This will give you s solid lining in your stomach so you're prepared. If you like this episode, be sure to like and subscribe. And if there's any ancient or vintage recipe you want to see me try out, let us know in the comments and I'll see you next time.